Hey, welcome back to the podcast. This week, our guest is Wayne Zell with Zell Law. Wayne, welcome. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me on your show. So, obviously, Wayne, you do a lot more than law. Um, you know, you do a lot of things with, um, you know, business exit strategy and things like that. And that's kind of what I want to concentrate on today. But what made you kind of what tell us your backstory of what really got you into law and then really getting into the the exit planning side of, of business? What got me into law is my father told me to go to law school because I had no, <laughs> no direction in life at the time. I was young and, and petulant and, and, you know, always searching for new things to do. I was a musician and an actor and did all kinds of crazy stuff. And he said, you need to know how to make a living. So first become a CPA and then become a lawyer. So that's what I did. I became a CPA in 1980. I went to Arthur Anderson and Company in their tax department, worked there, and decided because everybody else in the tax department was a lawyer, I needed to go to law school so I could learn how to write. So I went to law school, and uh, it was a great experience because it was a part of my brain, the left side of my brain, that I hadn't really exercised very hard. And uh, I learned how to do that. And I became a tax accountant and tax lawyer. And, um, you know, for the past, I guess, 44 years, I've been a CPA tax accountant. And for the past uh, 39, 40 years, I've been a, a lawyer practicing with tax as my background, but I really started doing transactional stuff. And so I did estate planning as one part of my practice. And then I did business planning as the other part of my practice. And what I've done is I've sort of merged these two concepts together in my advisory practice where I'm helping clients design their exit plans, both from an estate planning perspective and a business perspective, M&A, mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. helping founders and families transition the business to the next generation, whatever their exit plan is. I've seen a lot of this stuff. I've done probably 160 plus transactions to date, and we do three or four a year on average. And um, I wrote a book as a result of it because I had so many stories to tell that I wanted to uh, sort of wrap it into a book and, and it came out last May and it's done very well. So Wayne, you know, you, you talk about um, helping, you know, businesses with their exit strategy and stuff like that. Um, you know, I know from a, from, from an accounting and tax side also that, that many times business owners aren't doing that type of planning. When people are coming to you, how many of them truly have an exit strategy versus Hey, I want to get out tomorrow and I don't know what to do. None. Yeah. I mean, most of them come to me and they say, I want to, I've been, you know, approached by a private equity firm or an investment banker. They say it's time to sell. I'm ready to sell. Well, what have you done to prepare for that? Right. And so that's one of the things I help them with. And then the other group of people are you meet with a client and they they read they read my book or they heard me speak and they said, Well, I don't have an exit plan. What do I need to do? And some of these people have been in business for 20, 30, 40 years. Others are just starting out. And the question I always get is, well, when do I need to plan for my exit? And the answer is now. Now. You yeah. need to plan now. At the beginning, really. But if you haven't done anything, you need to start planning now. So most of the people that come to me haven't done a lot of thinking about it. Or if they have, there are gaps in their thinking. And so I try to help them fill the gaps. Why? I mean, you know, conceptually, why do you think that that they don't start thinking, and I shouldn't say they, we don't start thinking about that right away? Because we want to make the business successful and we invest ourselves as entrepreneurs into these businesses. I'm an entrepreneur. You're an entrepreneur. We invest ourselves in the business. And so we're working in the business uh, from day one, trying to make it more profitable, trying to grow it to get to that hockey stick growth level. And then what happens is we get so involved in the business, we forget to work on the business. And so we need to work on the business too, while we're working in the business. And it's, you know, you've written a book about this, assembling a good team of mm -hmm. people around you, professionals, as well as internal folks on your management team. You've got to have a good team to help advise you towards that. It's not just one person, right. it's your CPA, it's your lawyers, and then you may have more than one lawyer, and you probably should. It's your valuation people. It's your HR people. It's the marketing experts that can help you. Maybe an advisory board that you need to advise you to build towards your exit. 
whatever that may be. But you've got to have an exit in mind and you need to plan, back plan from that time that you are really planning to exit and say, well, no, I'm going to do it in five or 10 years. So that's not enough. From an exit planning perspective, you really have to pick a date and then back plan from that. That way you can plan toward a successful exit. Now, many small business owners are going to be like, oh, I'm too small to, to you know, think about this. Um, you know, what do you say to that type of an entrepreneur who's who's thinking that they're too small? It's funny. I, I had a, a client come to me the other day, a new client, and he said, um, this is a guy I've known for years, very successful. He's built an event planning business for a very small niche in the market. And he's making a million dollars a year. And it's just him. And I said, this is a valuable business. You're serving a niche. You've got expertise in this area. You have all the players and who to invite as speakers and how to do this. What's your plan? What's your exit plan? He said, I really haven't thought about it. I said, if you die tomorrow, what's going to happen to the business? If you become disabled tomorrow, what will happen to the business? He said, I guess it'll just have to shut down. I said, that's not good planning for your family because there may be value there that you can transfer to a buyer either with you continuing to work for the buyer or better yet, training somebody underneath you to take over and, and create what we call transferable value so that there is something that can be transferred so that you can monetize it for the benefit of your family. So he's the only guy in the business. This is, a lot of entrepreneurs are like this. Mm -hmm. where they may have a small group of people working for them. Your business succession plan should involve making sure that you've got the next generation of managers that can come in and take over the business, run it successfully as you have. And if you can't find anybody like you, you may need two or three people. Or maybe you need to sell it and then transition it while you're working with the buyer. I don't know. You know, It really depends on each individual situation. But you want to build transferable value. If you don't have that, built into your planning, you're leaving a lot on the table and you're not helping your family out a whole lot either. I think many of us think that we're, you know, just like, you know, being a, a man, we, we think that, you know, that, that we're going to live forever and be vibrant forever. Um, I think that- do you, do you really think that? No. <laughs> I know there's going to be that day at some point. But again, when you first start out, you're thinking, okay, I'm going to do this for a long time. I don't need to think about this. Right. But you're right, because, you know, people aren't thinking about if I pass away or if I'm disabled or, or anything like that. So, you know, we, we don't do that, that, that type of planning. Now, when you're because because you also do the estate planning side of things. And I've heard people say that, oh, you should always make sure that your you know, that your business is inside your trust. How do you feel yeah. about that? I, I agree with that. I think everybody should have a revocable living trust to start. But that's not the end of the story. So let, let me give you a, an example. Let's say you've got uh, a founder who's very charismatic, running the business day to day. Maybe he has or she has a management team working with her or him. And he's married. She's married. Usually when the estate planner gets involved, they don't really talk a lot about the business side. No. which is a big mistake. Who is going to be the trustee of the trust that owns your business if something happens to you? If you put your spouse in charge, that's a natural inclination to do so because you've done everything together. But maybe he's not involved in the business. Right. And if he's not involved in the business, that's not necessarily a good choice. So one of the things that I've done is in, in the book, I talk about this in great detail. It's your multi-million dollar exit. In one of the chapters, we talk about, well, you need to integrate your estate plan, your trust that owns your business with your business plan. And you can create what's called what I call a management succession plan. So in the business, you say, okay, if something happens to me, here's who's going to run the business. Here's who to call. Here's what their job is. Here's what they're being paid. Here's what their authority is. I don't want you firing them within three, right. six months a year after something happens to me so that we can continue to sustain the value for the family and for the employees of the business. And then you tie that management succession plan back to the estate plan and have the trustee bound by it 
and maybe have the trustee involved in a board of directors that runs the company with others that are already involved in running the company. So you have to think about not only allowing the managers to continue running the business, but you've got to think about how you integrate the ownership of that business with the management to make sure that it just the new owner, the, the spouse who comes in and says, ah, you all suck. I'm going to fire you. You all are out. That may not be what you want. It may not be what the employees want. They may feel very unsettled if something like that happens. This gives them peace of right. mind. Maybe a retention bonus is built into the plan. Maybe some kind of change in control bonus if we sell the company. So they're incentivized not only to continue working day to day, but to stay and make the business successful. And then on the estate planning side, maybe having a business trustee or a trust committee of people who consist of your family members, but also maybe others that you trust who can be professionals, who can help advise the family on the right thing to do, and then integrate that with your management succession plan. Make it binding on both sides. That's a real important consideration. But that's only if the unexpected happens. What you want to do is also have a plan for the expected. What is your ultimate plan for the company? You want it to just be a legacy company that's going to be generating cash flow for the family on an ongoing basis. There are ways to do that. But you've got to be, be sure that you keep your management team involved. Because if they leave, your company may be end, end up worthless. And that could be a disaster for the family as well as for the company. And I think for for many people that do have the small business, you talked about the 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 client earlier that it's just them, and it's again, but they have this idea. So you know what happens to the business when when they pass away? There's many times I can tell you that that um, we're getting calls. Hey, can, are you taking new clients? And it's because their CPA died, and that's yes. truly what it is. And, and if you look at at our profession, it's getting a lot older. There's not as many, you know, young people in those continuing education classes, um, you know, that we're going to. Um, you know, I keep looking at it, and it's like I'm 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 seeming to be getting the younger and younger, even though I'm getting older in a lot of these classes. So I, te I teach at uh, George Mason University in Fairfax. And one of the, and the course I teach is estate planning in the certified financial planning curriculum. So it's in the business school. It's not in the uh, law school. And I, I've noticed that more and more of the graduates are, are migrating into you know, financial planning, finance, investment banking, where there's a great opportunity for upside, fewer accounting graduates, mainly because the accounting industry has made it very difficult for people to become certified as CPAs, you have to go through a five-year educational program. Back when I did it, I was able to do it in four years and take my CPA exam in my, in my last year of college. But today it's much harder and it's a disincentive for young people to do it. So I think I'm seeing it just as you're seeing it. The, the profession is aging. What do you do with your clients? Same thing with lawyers. We have the same issue. I have a business succession plan that I'm building but it's tough to find people at the next generation who are capable, competent, and interested in being entrepreneurs like I am to take over the business and yeah. run the business after I'm gone if something happens. So it's a big, it's a big issue in our in our professions. Yeah, today. yeah. I, I I think part of it is is just you know I think certain you know, accounting certainly isn't in certain law it's just it's not sexy, and I think that that. You know, with our profession too, we have such a stigma that it's like, oh my God, you guys are just going twenty four seven all the time, and it's like, well, yes and no, depending on on your specialty and stuff. You know, obviously, during tax season, there's a limited amount of time, but then you know, if you do the right planning and do things like that, you're not working like a dog that whole time, right. and then the rest of the year, it's you know, regular hours type thing. So. Um, I'm talking about this more from, hey, business owner, make sure that that who you have as part of your team, your CPA, your attorney and stuff like that does have that plan. Do they have other people that are, are working in the office that are qualified to help you is, is the reason why I'm talking about this more, because many people aren't doing that that type of planning to be able to 
you know, yes, it's helps, helps my family, but it's more, it's helping the client to make sure that there's that succession going on. That's for sure. Exactly. We have to take care of our clients. You know, in, in your book, um, you make the point um, that to, you know, get the top dollar for your business. Can you go into that a little bit more and valuing the gaps and things like that? <clears throat> sure. I mean, one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs do is they talk to their friends and they talk to their uh, colleagues who are selling their businesses and they get an idea of this, you know, the co colleague sold the business for five times their earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, EBITDA, or seven times or 10 times. So therefore, that applies to their business. Well, that's a huge fallacy in and of itself. But the real question is, what is your business worth today? And what do you want it to be worth at the exit so that you can provide for yourself and your family mm -hmm. and your employees, et cetera, et cetera? And so there usually is a value gap. And what I find is that a lot of these folks overvalue their business without having done any kind of formal exercise in valuation. So one of the things I recommend is get somebody to help you do evaluation today of the business to set your real, your real expectations of what the business is worth today. And if you say, I, I think it's worth 10 million, but it's only worth two, you've got an $8 million gap if you want to get to 10 million so that it's you know, the ultimate price that you want to sell the business at. So that's a value, value in the sense that today it's worth less, tomorrow you need it to be worth more. Then the second question is, what are the value gaps? Do you have a good management team? Do you have good marketing and sales? Are you a manufacturer? Do you have good sources of supply that are diverse? All of these things go into determining what the value proposition is for the business and what the value gaps are. And so if you're concentrated only in one supplier or you've only got one big client, that's going to create a depression in the value or diminishment of the value, believe it or not. So you could you use a, a standard multiple of EBITDA to, de to determine the value of the business. Second thing is, what are the tax consequences on selling the business? If you sell assets, if you sell your stock in the business or your membership interest in your LLC, what are the tax consequences? And it's not just, oh, I'll have to pay capital gains tax. You may or you may not, depending on what you're selling. But you also may have state income tax that you've got to factor into all of that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to get your CPA involved and you've got to get your financial planner. The question is, how much do I need to live on if I do sell the business? And do I have enough if I sell it after tax to live for the rest of my life if I'm not going to continue working? If I am, then it, it may not be as big of an issue. But you've got to do financial planning as part of this. So the key members of your team should be your financial planner. Should be your CPA who's involved in helping with the taxes, should be an estate planning lawyer and a corporate lawyer, which I do happen to do both, which is it's kind of rare to you know, find people in my yeah. profession to do both. But then also having other people help you fill those value gaps. You don't have a management team or you don't have a manager that is willing to step up and run the business if something happens to you. What is your plan for that? How do you fill in that value gap? So the book talks about you know, the value proposition in your business, every business is different. I do give a lot of examples. And then how do you fill those value gaps to get to your ultimate exit? And then in planning for the exit, do you want to sell? Do you want to pass it on to the next generation of family? Do you want to pass it on to the next generation of managers? Do you want to sell it to your managers? Do you want to try to Sell the business in the form of an ESOP, employee stock ownership plan. There's so many different exit strategies. And so the, the book also has a whole chapter on the exit strategies. And with that, you build in your estate plan. Because if the business is really valuable, say more than $25, $30 million in value, there may be estate planning consequences that right. you need to be aware of. That You may be able to shift some of the wealth without shifting all the control out of your hands to future generations or even just your spouse and get it out of your estate for estate tax purposes. Why is that important? Because in Maryland, they apply an estate tax at 16% over, what is it, $6 million? Yep. Around that. And then in federal, it's $13.61 million this year, but it's going to drop by 50% at the end of 2025. And it's a 40% tax. 
So there's a lot of planning that goes into this to make sure that you're thinking about all these consequences instead of just thinking, oh, I can sell a business for 10 million and that's all I need for the rest of my life. Is that all you need? And if you sold it for 10 million, are you going to end up with six after taxes? That's you know big, big questions. Right, right. And then, and then, you know, also, you know, looking at, you know, economic downturn and, you know, everybody's so worried right now because of the election and, and what, what changes are going to have from a tax standpoint, you know, depending on there. And then also with as much money the past couple of years that, that the government has given out, nobody's paid tax on. I mean, obviously, you know, the deficit is, is, it has, keeps growing. So somehow or another that needs to be paid down. So, you know, you would think, you would think it needs to be paid yeah. down. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of factors that come into this. Um, I definitely think that, um, you know, looking to have somebody like you as part of someone's team, you know, is is really important. Um, because, again, everybody thinks about, oh, I'm trying to I'm in, I'm in my growth phase. I need to think about that. It's like like you keep saying, you know, you do because of many, many different uh, you know, reasons that, that are there. Um, can you tell us more, you know, with the, with the exit strategy, you know, if you decide, okay, I want to, I don't have a family I can leave this to in the fact that there's nobody, not my, my kids don't want to be a set. Um, and, you know, looking at that and um, if I'm starting to groom someone who's much younger to, to take over. Um, is this a viable way of being able to, I'm going to say, graduate out of the business? You know, if you don't have a family member, that's pretty common. I mean, a lot of families don't want to be involved in the business. So in my book, I have a whole, I have a hypothetical that I lay out in chapter one, and it runs all the way through the book about this guy, George, who's got a daughter who's in the business and two kids who are not. Very common occurrence. And if you don't have anybody, what do you do? You need to think about bringing in someone who might be interested in helping you with the business to, to succeed you in the business. If you cannot find that person, then it may be better to try to sell it to somebody else who is willing to buy it from you at a price that you're willing to accept and the price that they're willing to pay. But then you stay on with the business for two or three years to help transition it to the next, to the buyer. And it all depends on the type of business we're talking about. If you're talking about a landscaping business or an HVAC business or a roofing business, there are a lot of companies that are actually rolling up these businesses into larger entities that have expertise in your area. And so I've done that with many of my clients. We've sold you know, roofing companies, for example, to private equity backed roll-ups that are operating roofing companies all over the United States. It seems to be a common area. HVAC companies, too, another very common area. Landscaping companies. I've sold several landscaping companies over my career. And so the idea is if you don't have somebody in mind who can take over from you, and you can't just leave it to the family because they won't be able to you know, take right. it over, yep. then why not consider selling it to a third party and then staying involved for some period of time so that you can have a successful transition and maximize the value that you might get out of the sale. And that's that's another option. Right. Instead of just clicking down and taking the money out of the bank account, which you're, you're not going to get anything for the business. You have customers that may need help in the future, clients. You have uh, processes that you've built that you know show how you can do things better than other people. You have people that are valuable to the business and helping to service the clients. Uh, you may have a product you, that is really cool. Whatever you've got, you want to be able to preserve and enhance that value toward an exit. And that's what my focus in life is. That's what Aspire to Exit is. I have a separate company that is built solely for exit planning. And we bring in other experts as needed to help support the exit planning process if it's not legal in nature. If we're doing estate planning, we do that at Zell Law. If we're do, doing business planning, we do that at Zell Law. That's you know, it's legal contracts, drafting, negotiating and acquisitions, but you know, doing a due diligence exercise, trying to get ready for a sale. 
anyone can do that. Lawyers are not the only people that get involved in that. And so right. there's there's processes that need to be built, documented. And if you haven't documented your processes or your software or whatever you've got, take time to do that stuff because it does add value to the business. Right, right. Yeah, I think that that's, I mean, again, you you, you talk about those processes. It's, it's kind of like, you know, you know, McDonald's, I mean, all these franchises and stuff like that, that's what they're, you know, that's truly what they're selling it, you know, besides the name, they're, they're selling you processes, you know, yes. to, to be successful. And systems, yeah. So, so when we talked about a bunch of stuff, I could go on hours with this because I, because I truly find it fascinating and that, that all business owners need. Um, what have I not asked you, you wish I had? What have you not asked me? What is your business exit plan, Wayne? I, I was I was getting ready to choke. I was going to ask me what mine was. I was going to tell you. I'm like I'm like uh, most other people don't have yet. I'm working on mine. I've I'm, I've been challenged because it's hard to find somebody to take over one aspect of our business, the business planning side. Right. Um, most of the lawyers that do that type of stuff are in larger law firms, and they're getting paid you know extraordinary amounts of money to be partners in these law firms. And they're not entrepreneurial. They want guaranteed salaries. And as you know, it's hard to do that in a small business. Yeah. But there's a there's 5,000 clients that you've got that you can inherit and, and take care of. So right. that's my big challenge. It's whether to uh, you know, bring in somebody to sort of take over that side of the business or just outsource it and continue to grow it uh, the way we've been doing it and then ultimately sell the business down the road. So that's that's the question. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's, it's when you have um, multiple, uh, I'm going to say multiple entities that you have and many different things that you're doing, uh, you know, in, in many ways you are the unicorn, you know, when it comes to to this and yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things, finding, finding that one person to, to step in, to do all that. If they do have that skill level. Lots of times, like you said, they're not entrepreneur. They're just, they, they want to collect that paycheck and, and do their work. Not that they don't care about it, but they just don't want to be out there having to do it all. Or take the risk. That's yeah. the other piece. Yeah. So, you know, Wayne, if people like what they hear and they would like to talk to you, how can they, how can they reach out to you? How can they find your book and, and maybe even, you know, listen to, you know, some of, uh, you know, your opinions on things? How can they sure. Be? Go to our, uh, the law firm's website is zellaw, Z-E-L-L-L-A-W.com, where there's a ton of content, including all our podcasts and video casts, which we host a podcast called Blueprint for Wealth, have been doing it for many, many years, where I interview entrepreneurs and educational topics, tax, state, business planning. Then we also have aspire to exit.com, which is uh, our business exit planning site. And then, of course, my book, your multi-million dollar exit is available on Amazon in paperback, hardback, uh, Audible. I did the narration of the book and uh, there's a website, waynezell.com, where you can actually download pieces of the book that are checklists. There's a management succession plan on there and some other things that uh, you can't get in the Audible version of the book. So those are the ways to get in touch with us and if you have legal needs, call us at Zell Law. But if you want to talk about exit planning, uh, you know, contact us through Aspire to Exit. Great. Wayne, I really appreciate your time today. I think, uh, you know, listeners definitely um, have gotten something to think about, you know, when it comes to what to do with their businesses now. Wayne, thank you for being here uh, this week with us. Our guest was Wayne Zell with Zell Law. I'll see you guys next week.